Welcome back. I'm here again with Dr. Sean McFay. And today we're going to talk about the project that is for me like beating a dead horse, but I, I, we can't not talk about it. So we're going to return to Russia, Ukraine. We, I just did an episode answering the question of whether the Russians were going to run out of, of people or run out of men. So definitely check that out. But uh, today we're, it is August 9th and uh, still fighting. The Russians are, I believe, have controlled most of Luhansk, but I think the Ukrainians started pushing back in Luhansk, still fighting over the Donbass region. In the south, there's some back and forth and uh, taking, you know, destroying bridges, things like that. And the HIMARS systems are wreaking havoc, but there's a lot of back and forth. The Russians claiming that they're taking these things out before they even have a chance to deploy. Can't, can't really report on the veracity of that. We're not. By the way, there's one question we you raised in a prior episode about Putin failing strategically. Yeah. I I I I think I think he knows exactly what he's doing. And I think he knows exactly what the end state's gonna be by December. Yeah. So I, I when he's when he started the invasion in February. He did fail strategically. He had the wrong strategy. He was waging a conventional war in, I would argue, a post-conventional war era. It failed. They didn't get to, they didn't take Kiev in five days as not just he thought, but like American pundits on TV who are ex-generals were saying all these things too, you know? And then I think what late March or April, they switched their strategy. They moved to the East. They're fighting much more unconventionally. They're doing some other things. And they know that, one, NATO is not going to intervene if they don't do something like nuclear. And time is on their side as well as the Ukrainians. And, you know, they I think they adapted their strategy. And I think that all Putin has to do, really, is if he can make Ukraine a landlocked country, he could just cook it. You know, he doesn't need he doesn't need much more than that. I think that. I th- you know, at the beginning, the question is like, was is NATO going to intervene? Could it go nuclear? I think all that stuff is now out of the way, and he's just free to, to you know, ravage Ukraine, and Ukraine is ra- free to ravage back, and then we'll see where it lands. Uh, kind of a war of, of you know attrition to some extent. So I think what the end state is going to look like, if you'll notice, a few weeks back, Gazprom lowered the output of the capacity of the Nord Stream, no, the output of the Nord Stream pipeline by 60%. And then they said, oh, we're just doing repairs. We're just doing repairs right now. A few weeks later or a week later, they dropped it to 20%. The Germans are freaking out. They're starting to conserve as much oil or, or sorry, natural gas as they possibly can by advising people not to, to lower their electricity bills in the summer so that they can be prepared in the winter. And so that's, that's one thing on the strategic side. I think Putin is going to have dramatically fewer sanctions by the time we're in December than he does right now. And I think that's going to, right now he's targeting, you were talking about in a prior episode about putting a wedge in NATO. The wedge is, is starting with Germany and yeah. Germany and Austria and Italy are, you know, deeply invested in Russia, or deeply invested enough in Russia and France. And Hungary, there. Hungary as yeah. well. Hungary's and Hungary. And so here's the thing about sanctions. They take, they make good headlines when you do them, but they take a long time to set in. And what happens is that your, your alliance cohesion starts to wither. And then come the cold weather in you know East and Northern Europe, it'll drive attention. And you know this is you know and they weaponize economics. That's why they are in Ukraine. They're, they're that's why they're in Libya. Russia was in Libya not because they need more petro. They they have a petro economy because again in they Italy. control. Yeah, in Italy they control whoever controls Libya has a spigot of illegal immigration, weapons, narcotics into the EU, which makes you very political when you're negotiating with the EU. And, you know, Russia does this. They And they're smart about this. I mean, Putin's a, he's, I think, one of the best strategic leaders 
of his generation. And, and I say that not because I admire him. I do not admire Mr. Putin. But you got to give it to the guy from, you know, 1999. He took over a country that was, you know, fourth world destroyed. And now it's it's like, a, you know, rising hegemon. And, you know, I think he made a huge blunder in February, but he's correcting for it. I'm not, again, I'm not pro Putin, but you have to admire some of the, some of the strategic savvy. Well, and then the second piece in terms of the economic warfare is he very astutely reinforced success in the South yeah. and is controlling the South. And, you know, he came up with, I think the, the, the Turks, and the Ukrainians, they worked out some grain deal where they're able yeah. to, to ship. But what happened the next day? He bombed Odessa. Right. So, so he still, like, you control those ports in the south yeah. and you steadily choke Ukraine and have them wither on the vine so that, you know, by over the next five years, you just have a you know, dis, dissatisfaction to such yeah. an extent. And, you know, you, you throw an election the Russian way. And you just change the leadership and it's a fait accompli. Exactly. And I I think that's the strategy. And I think, I don't know how easy it will be for him to take Odessa, but I think if if he can make it a landlocked country, again, he could just cook it at that point and then do a Russian regime change. And it's what he's done. That's his playbook, right? I mean, he's done that in... uh, was done in Ukraine before Georgia. He's done it in uh, Armenia, arguably. Yeah. So that's, and I think, you know, that's likely to, I, you know, I don't know what Ukraine can do in the long run. Does that make sense? You know, unless there's an, an external intervention, which I can't mm-hmm. see happening unless, you know, it might be different if, Putin uses a nuclear weapon someplace, even if he uses it in Siberia, just pops it off to show the world his, his seriousness. You know, that could reaffirm things. And also a change of an election in this country could, cha- you know, could could change it. But, you know, I think NATO and the EU will have a withering winter, especially if it's hard, and it might mm-hmm. change some of their strategic decision-making calculus in a pro-Russian way. Now, in terms of manpower, so I, like, as I mentioned, I did this analysis and I looked at various estimates. I assumed for all estimates, you know, one KIA for every three wounded in action. Because the Ukrainians, as an example, as you can imagine, if I asked you, if I gave you four countries, the US, Russia, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom, which of those countries has the highest estimate for Russian losses and which of those countries has the lowest estimates? What are your answers? What are the countries again? Russia, Russia. Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's pretty predictable that Ukraine probably says it's going to be the highest losses for Russia. Russia will be the lowest Russia. I think uh, between the UK and, and the US, I think UK is lower. I think the US would say it's higher. They think there'd be a higher casual. It's the opposite. Yeah, the but UK. keep in mind, UK is closer in proximity to well, Russia. I know that. So they yeah, have an incentive, I know. I they have an incentive to. Oh, to I was thinking. Of, okay, I was thinking they also, unlike the US, have people on the ground, you know, I mean, who work for the. For London, but I mean, yeah, you I mean UK with its post Brexit world is decided. So they're learning that's a pretty scary world. Unlike say 2012, it looked very different back then. They're not part, they're part of NATO, but they're not part of the EU and their MOD is kind of strapped for cash. They brought this huge, they blew all their money on this huge aircraft carrier that, you know, could probably be taken down by a hypersonic missile. You know, that's what they put their bet on. And the thing looks goofy. It's called the Queen Elizabeth, I think. And it has like these two contours. You know, aircraft carriers have one sort of tower right and mm-hmm. then this thing has two it looks it looks it looks like a i don't know it looks very weird but yeah they want f-35s and aircraft carriers they don't they can't afford f-35s it's like a, it's like a complete mess you know well i mean so is the f-35 it's a complete well, mess that's a big yeah but like all the, i mean finland just bought all a bunch of them and germany just put it orders anyway it's it's, a, it's very expensive but i would say yeah that is that you know weapon you know Russia is making it using its old friend of winter into a weapon again. 
And because they've mm-hmm. always weaponized winter, whether it's Napoleon or or Hitler. And now it's going to be 2022, 2023, because I think a lot of, you know, in democracies in Europe, there'll be a lot of demand for for heat and that will change things. So we'll see where that goes. But I think, yeah, I think you're, you know, this this is not over. And I don't think that, you know, Samantha Power can shame Russia into retreat as much as she'd like to do so. Yeah, I should, there's, there's... I should pick on her. I should not pick on her. Uh, it's totally fair. She's just one of these, like, she's a journalist. She's a journalist who's now making s- significant national security decisions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a place where you want a former journalist to be. Right. Right? Because yeah. they have very strong opinions without any backing. Well, general. I've always wondered, like, what would the journalist Samantha Powers interviewing current government Samantha Powers, like, what would that interview look like? I think it'd be very sparky, you know, maybe. very frictious. Fractious. Maybe, maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah, so I, I think that's definitely a possibility. So in ter- going back to like the troop losses, though, if I kind of look at that range, now granted, there's only one estimate that actually breaks out the KIAs versus wounded in action, and that's the either the White House or the CIA's estimate, or maybe it's one and the same. But that said, that that said that there were about fifteen thousand Russian KIA's as of kind of the end of July, and about forty five thousand injured. So that's a one to three ratio. So if I take the Ukrainian number, so what I did was not necessarily fair, right? What I did is I said, if the Ukrainians say that thirty eight thousand Russians right. died, that implies that KIA plus wounded in action is over 150 K, which right. is more than the Russian armed forces that actually right. run in it, which is ridiculous, right? right. Which is yeah. kind of how you do, you kind of, that's how you test some of these right. assumptions about sure. their ridiculousness. But if, if you look at what the loss rate is per day, at the low end, the Russians are, and again, you're taking, I'm taking their estimate way back from March, and I just assume it projects forward. It was 180 men a day or manpower, but most of the Russian forces are male. The Ukrainians, it was like 1,055 a day, right? Which is just not, not credible. And I would say, I can't recall what the British number is off the top of my head, but the U.S. has two estimates. And you're looking at between 400 and 480 losses a day. So if I take kind of the size of the Russian armed forces and I – remove all the all the forces that they already have for deployed and certain military commitments in Georgia, Transdenistra, Kyrgyzstan, uh, Armenia, other places. And I remove kind of the what they put into Ukraine. Yeah. And I also remove the casualties thus far. And then you know take that away from the entire size of the armed forces and assume that they can only whatever's left, they can only supply 25 to 30 percent. If I make that assumption and I and I don't bring in any of the conscription numbers or reserves or prisoners, right? Because there's prisoner recruitment. If I don't include those, even by their estimates, by Ukrainian estimates, we talked about this, the U- Ukrainian military intelligence saying that the Russians would culminate mm-hmm. in August. Right. That's basically that with the it, at the low end, at the at the high end of their number, they run out in a month. Like the Russians mm-hmm. just run out of, of men, right? Which is ridiculous. If you look at the Russian number, the high end is about three and a half years. Yeah. If you look at the US estimate, it's something between nine and 16 months. Okay. Yeah. Now, so a way to look at that is the Russians have between nine and 16 months to refresh their manpower reserves. So that's mm-hmm. recruiting against the 134,500 conscripts which is likely to be a challenge. I think it's proven to be a challenge, but let's say they can do that. They have 2 million reserves, probably not great, right? I saw there's one picture of this grotesquely obese 62-year-old 60, general. Have you seen that picture? No, but I, I've seen obese generals before in, in the Russian world, so yeah. I mean, this, this, guy, looks like a, this guy looks like, like a cue ball. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'll Sparring find it. Leadership, yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, in, in post-production, you'll you'll see it. It's on the yeah, screen. Right. Yeah. Um, the wide-angle view. Yeah. 
I didn't even know if we, I didn't even believe it was real. It was so really. <laughs> yeah. They have uniform um, to fit him. Wow. No, they well, had they, they actually had to create a special uniform. To, well, yeah. So what, I mean, look, I, I'm not you know I'm not making I'm not I'm not making fun of like people being obese, but if you're in the military environment, yeah, you, if you're you leading on yeah, that doesn't look good. It's a bad look. It's a bad look. Yeah. So so when so what do you I mean so here's the question. I mean, I think it's you know, obviously oh, by, 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 by the way, by the way, just to, just to, just to finish, if yeah. I add those numbers back in, yeah. You have something like even by Ukrainian numbers, you have seven years, right? Mm-hmm. And then by Russian numbers, you're talking 42 right. years, right? Yeah. And the US is in the middle, like 15 years. So they're fine. Right. They're gonna be just fine if they right. get through the next nine to 16 months is the point. But I, I think ahead. that's I true. I mean, I think like look, this is a legacy item for Putin, who probably has he's dying of cancer. It's the word in the street. And, you know, this is what he needs to do. You can't put back the Russian empire without Ukraine. I mean, that's, Mm -hmm. it's like, it's almost like Northern Ireland to the British. I mean, you have to have it. And I think time is on their time. So I I think that the the problem, and you may have insight into this is, you know, he's sold his domestic base that still matters a little bit to him. That this would be a short and easy, not even war. What, what do you originally call it? Some peacekeeping thing? Oh, and, a special military operation. Yeah, exactly. Whatever that mouthful is. And the fact that it's it's not resolved is going to require, you know, he can't just draft conscripts from the periphery of Russia. He can't just use mercenaries. I, I track mercenaries. The Wagner group there is looking for the dregs. It's not Spetsnaz. Any guy or, or gal can hold a Kalishnikov, you know, and they all know that they're going to be cannon fodder anyway. So they have, you know, if he has to do core Russia, if he's got to like act in you know, a recruit and like maybe conscript core Russians, that would be maybe a political turning point. I think he could manage it. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying I'm not saying that's a breaking point, but I think that matters. I mean, we don't think of him as a Democrat. He's really not. But right. remember that the Afghan Soviet war it's in its final years in the late 1980s, it was the only big successful peace movement against the Soviets from within was all these mothers of dead soldiers asking where their sons go. This is supposed to be a quick and easy war. And it became very political. And I know Mr. Putin, who was a young KGB idealist back then, knows that. It's in his mind. So there is a sensitivity. Now, I don't know. I'm not sure if we can manipulate that or if that is a constraint at all. Maybe he can just easily mobilize another, you know, tens of thousands of soldiers you know with you know in the next 12 months but yeah, I look, do- he's got he's got he's got four hundred thousand male prisoners that yeah. he can add to the mix a little over right. that but yeah so i think but i think that it is going to be a war of attrition at some point and ukraine can't win that war they can rally shout and yell on, on tv and as much as we love ukrainians you know it might be an attritional attrition based strategy at the end of the day well, plus they're also like their propaganda machine took a a pretty bad turn in the in the last month with yeah. that, that that you know ridiculous Vogue <clears throat> thing. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, maybe maybe they weren't mis. I think they were what they what they were doing is they were marketing to a British audience, right? Yeah. Um, but like in the U.S., like we don't give a fucking shit about monarchs. Fuck monarchs. Right. Right. Like we're we're about overthrowing monarchs. That's right. So, like when I saw that, I was just like, "What the fuck are you right. guys doing?" Right. Then well, the also, second thing, yeah. the second thing they did that was even that was even more objectionable was that they put Americans on their sanctions list or or whatever. It's probably not a sanctions list, but like whatever their equivalent of a a censor list is. Like they put Glenn Greenwald on it. They put a few others, and it's just like, guys, what are you doing? Like I think I think uh, they've made some blunders. Also, Snake Island in the beginning of the war. Uh, oh yeah, the, the, yeah. the ghost I mean, of ghost of Kiev. That's right. right. So I think these things will catch up. Those work in the short term if you want to lie overtly, but in the long term, you're you know the, if you lose your credibility, then that's kind of like that's a huge center of gravity for them. Was their sort mm-hmm. of soft power appeal, and they're you know being 
you know, lo losing credibility is hard to earn back. And so I agree with you that they're, and they're not, they're not slicing and dicing their audience well. They shouldn't be attracting UK. They should be attracting the United States. Yeah, because that that's where all be the ultimately effort. all the resources are. Yeah, that's right. where all the resources and are. they are in the US, let's face it, controls NATO. So, you know, I, that's what they need to be doing. And as you say, it's deeply ingrained in American culture that we do not care for monarchs. We just do not, you know, and to many Americans, the whole British monarchy is kind of bizarre to begin with, you know, right, right. Uh, you know, so it's just, you know, but you're right. I mean, I think that Ukraine might be, I'm not sure they're over a tipping point. I'm not going to say that, but right. they've got some, some chinks in their little, literal armor as well. Yeah. And I'm, and again, I'm, I'm obviously being over overly critical, right? Because they're a country that is f literally fighting for their lives. So I don't sure. want to, I don't want to minimize that. But if, you know, Ukrainians are listening, particularly people who are responsible for the government, news, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, like, I'm just trying to be helpful. Like, that's helpful feedback. Because yeah. when I saw it, I was just like, I don't give a rat's ass about the elites yeah. of Ukraine. I don't care. Right. I, I care about the guy who's shouldering the rifle and protecting his homestead from yeah. the Russian Russian barbarians. Like that's the right. that's the story that like Bucha, like that was particularly effective right. in terms of really riling me up and you know, like yeah. what the hell? Like you guys, you, you guys pulled all, like every like men out of the population and shot them in the back of the head. Like how yeah. what kind of cowardly nonsense is that, Russia? So yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry, I don't mean to. No, I just so I mean Ukraine has a story to tell. The world still rallies around Ukraine. In Washington D.C., where I live, people fly Ukraine flags <laughs> out their windows or everywhere. The you gotta be for the latest. Flag. You gotta be for the latest thing, right? Well, the latest thing. Well, the, the next the next latest thing is vaccines for monkeypox. Like you gotta oh, get the jab. Oh. You gotta get the monkey jab. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> You know, what's, what's amazing to me is this is a little bit of a, a all the Democrats who are against the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq are suddenly pro-war in Ukraine, right? And there's like no <laughs> thinking about, there's no critical thought in that process. That said, Ukraine is everywhere. The Kennedy Center, you know, which is the opera house here and the theater here, the big one on the rivers, up in, in red and yellow lights to celebrate Ukraine. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm for Ukraine. They just, you know, the thing about, you know, information war, this is what it comes down to information war, which is, it's a, it has to be a main effort, effort in modern war. But, it, you know, you, it's like playing with fire. I mean, the blow, we call blowback in the media world, right? Can, can be very severe. It can really harm you. So you got to be savvy. And they have been very savvy up in, you know, but, but they've had some big blunders as well. So if they can keep that up, and I think Zelensky has been a secret weapon, but not just him, but all these like Twitter feeds that come from Ukrainians on the front line. And we don't know if, how accurate they are. Let's put that out there. But some of them are hilarious and they get retweeted, right? I mean, that is... Mm -hmm. That's clever. But at the end of the day now, what Russia is doing is I think unconventional. They're just doing what, you know, they're doing obliteration by artillery. And that's, what? you know, we, we look at artillery and say, oh, that's conventional war. Well, they're using it in an unconventional sense. I mean, the idea is, you know, you don't obliterate city blocks of civilians or throw rockets into Odessa. That's not conventional war. That's using a conventional war weapon in an unconventional war way. Yeah, and it's a terror tactic. It is. So, you know, and the question is, you know, they're really a terrorist state. Russia has become a terrorist state in, in the fact that their armed forces are making a policy or a strategy of inflicting terror from Bucha to all these other things. And their idea is to make Ukraine capitulate under the pain and weight of civilian atrocity where they come to the negotiation table on, on Moscow's terms not on Zelensky or the West's terms. And, you know, and I think Russia knows that the West is not going to do an intervention at this point. So he can go, they can all do that. And I think that's what's going to happen. Now, the fact that they negotiated for grain to be released is interesting. And I think that's because some of, of Putin's allies were like, hey, bud, we need to eat. So...
Well, also there is something in it for Russia because I think of course. I, I, I looked at this a few weeks ago and I believe the largest recipient of Ukrainian grain was guess who? Lebanon. Turkey. Turkey. Well, it makes sense. Lebanon's getting a lot of it too, but yeah, Turkey. <clears throat> yes, Erdogan. So what what is Russia what does Russia gain by negotiating with another autocrat in the region that's connected well, with NATO? He, still, NATO he, yeah. he helps drive a wedge, additional right. wedge. Yeah. And you know, the Turks are Erdogan is obviously cognizant of being an autocrat. He can't have his people rising up against him. So he needs to make sure that they have food come the winter. Well, it makes him very political within NATO. If he's the if he's the the Senator Manchin of NATO, then he could do all these things. Well, the Senator Manchin of NATO is uh, well, actually no, I guess Hungary is not Hungary is not Orban. NATO, or, yeah. Well, yeah, I think it is in NATO. Is um, it in NATO? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. He he's the Manchin of NATO. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So the the thing is, is like NATO is, and so NATO, like remember, like in February, March, NATO is like, oh my goodness, NATO resurrected. How awesome! Well, let's give it time, right? Because NATO is really rusty. It became a pro-democracy organization after the Cold War ended, rather than a really a defense thing. They went to mm-hmm. Afghanistan because the U.S. strong-armed into it, and that was kind of a, a mess. We'll see what happens to NATO and with uh, the cohesion around it. I'm not saying it's going to break, and I don't want to be super pessimistic, but there's a lot of hoopla in American media about NATO is going to stand up and blah, blah, blah. I'm not convinced that's as easy assumption to make as people are making. One thing that's interesting though, this is, this is the first, I wouldn't say first time, but this having Sweden and Finland join, it's not like we're getting another Eastern European state that we have to defend. Like right. Swedish military oh, capability yeah. is very strong. And then the Finns obviously have probably one of the best, if not the best rapid deployment capabilities yeah. in the world. So well, the, we actually the Finns, gained yeah. capability, right? Well, they, they were kind of always assumed to be there, but it's now they're in the fold that's good. And so Sweden had a real change of strategic posture in the last, say, 10 years where they moved away from, you know, using development as a tool of foreign policy into hard power defense. And, and then Finland has always had a relationship with Russia. Uh, the Winter War of 1941 was pretty amazing for those who wish to study it. When Finland fought Russia, not because they're a pro-Nazi, they weren't. It's just that Finland and Russia have an ancient, ancient beef. And the Finns are tough people. I saw a, a really funny political cartoon. You know, like when you have to log on to a website, it says it has these grids and says like, pick out the bicycle or whatever and all these pictures. It had like a nine, like a, a three by three grid of just like a snowy forest. And it says, pick out their Finnish sniper. And it, you every couldn't see was, anything. Yeah, it's, yeah, you could see anything. So <laughs> like, you know, and, uh, yeah, so they, and, and Finland just bought a bunch of F-45s and they're in the Baltics, of course, are very serious about this. I mean, Poland, even though it's, it's government, this politicians in the current regime are, are very controversial, the Polish people, I mean, so these, these ancient, you know, concerns are still all there. And this idea of war in Europe is still all there. You know, we can discuss like, why don't we react this way in African countries? But leaving that aside, there is, I think if, if especially if we get a, a president in 2024 in the US who wants to pull out of NATO and wants to be more of an isolationist perspective you know i mean aside, aside from trump could you possibly imagine any like DeSantis would be the the leading you know the other or the leading candidate i don't think DeSantis is that stupid <clears throat> well i don't know because you know look there's there's trump there's trumpism without trump right i mean and you can look at the governor of virginia is it yonkin i think i forget his name who kind of ran yonkin, that camp yeah, yeah who kind of ran that campaign successfully you know, Virginia, is, it's, it was a sort of a unique case. It may not be a, a, you know, a model for other campaigns, but there is this idea. I think a lot of Americans are tired of America is becoming world police, going abroad to fight other people's fights, getting bogged down. And I think some of that fatigue is, is warranted. And I think our, you know, why we went to war in Iraq and stayed in Afghanistan is, 
you know, his, you know, that's a, that's going to be history books and history books from, from, from here on out. Now, do we leave places like South Korea and do we leave places like Okinawa and Germany and Poland? That's, I don't know. I know, I know the, I know the Department of Defense would say no, but right. that's, that's Department of Defense. It doesn't mean that they're right. But I think that, you know, if Putin, who could be very ambitious, particularly if he's dying and has his legacy item, feels a little emboldened that, you know, would he put pressure on the Baltics as a test case for NATO? You know, that's... that's so the there, there's question. there's an anecdotal... I don't know I don't know where I saw this, so I can't, I can't attest to its veracity, but there, somewhere I read that in some meeting with his generals, either he or somebody else said, like, we should have gone through the Balkans first. Oh, sorry, sorry, the Baltics. The Baltics, the Baltics first. Well, so they were, I don't, again. Yeah, well, they're NATO now. I mean, that would be. I, I know, I know, but even, no. But, but. I mean, it would be, uh, it, would Trump, be diff- yeah. it would be difficult after they rolled through it, right? Because well, it's even, a question, yeah. I mean, like, would, Amer- would Americans want to risk nuclear war with Russia over, like, 5 million people in Latvia? That's- uh, if, if the Russians came in and killed it killed the tripwire or you know which is Maybe. the 82nd airborne and oh know, right the yeah well, if they killed americans but yeah that's why we have americans there but like you know do yeah. we do we you know really i think some americans and i think they're right to ask this question like why can't europe defend itself you know why can't you know they don't like russia but like that's not our it's not, it's not our problem is that well that that's the biggest irony of this whole thing right the the, mm. the germans as an example have not defended themselves, which is why they have these like high social policies. That's where they've been able right. to afford it. So they're right. they've been sneering down at us for not free having those problem. policies, right? Because they've been a free rider on defense. Yeah. So, but then, that said, Putin did more for NATO than yeah. Trump ever did in terms of getting the Germans to pay their right. share, right? Yeah. I mean, like okay, yeah. instantly. They up their defense budget like that. Yep. They, so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think there's a, you know, I think it's, I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, I share the opinion that we should be in, you know, part of NATO with this, this strategic ground. But I can, I am also, I understand the perspective of a lot of Americans, like enough's enough. Let the world deal with their problems or effed up problems and let them, you know, why do we have to send our sons and daughters and why do we have to pay all this money? I mean, all the money we have like s- s- wasted in Iraq and Afghanistan, if you ask me, failed wars, like six plus trillion dollars. I mean, it's it's funny now, trillion doesn't sound like a big number given all the craziness <laughs> last two years, which is, it's a big number though. It's a big number, right? But still, I I, uh, I, I can see that maybe becoming an issue, especially, you know, who knows where the Ukraine war will be in 2024. And it may be still rolling and maybe people, Americans will have forgotten about it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, I can't I can't make a good argument for Afghanistan, but I can make a little bit of one for Iraq, which is not directly related to Iraq. But the reason it's important to stay in NATO is because the way of life that most Americans hold today is not free. It doesn't come easy. Right. And the reason it we have it is because we expend a tremendous amount of resources in order to ensure the free flow of goods and services around the world. And part of, you know, the the most cynical person would say this, but they're not wrong. Like part of Iraq is to increase stability in the Middle East so that we have free access to oil and the rest of the world has access to that oil. And again, I haven't Again, because the media is not covering it very well, I don't. I'm not sure what the state of Iraq is right now, but if I if if I use as a proxy lack of coverage, I'd say it's a little bit more stable than it was. That's probably not true, but I haven't I haven't been following it. So that's the argument yeah. for the Americans who are weary of all this stuff. And plus, they haven't. The only Americans, frankly, who've been sacrificing are the people who've served voluntarily. Well, that is true, and less than one percent of the country serve which is another issue. But I would say that, I mean, there's a lot of reasons I believe that the U.S. should remain engaged 
in uh, NATO. I don't think that's true for all parts of the world, but I think Correct. Europe, and there's some historical things and you could say, hey, it's, you know, whatever. There's, you could, you could read negatively into that, but I do also think that some of the world's biggest economies are in Europe. Americans like to go to Europe for tourism and like food. And, you know, I just think like it's, it's closer to Americans than say Somalia is, you know, in terms of culture and visibility and, and also lineage. And, you know, so I just, you know, it doesn't, <clears throat> I, I, I think that Putin, if the U.S. were, just look at this course of action, were to withdraw leadership from NATO and focus on else other things, you know, I think it's, a, Russia would have a divide and conquer strategy for, for Eastern Europe moving West. You know, we already has Hungary and parts of Poland, you know, and I think that it would be very hard for, you know, I mean, I think Europe would essentially balkanize, you know, politically, and some would be yes, some would be no, but then some would feel the pressure. And I think it would be a much more unstable global order and an unstable, you know, that could have more direct impacts on us than killing in the Congo, which is horrible and a humanitarian tragedy. But America, Americans are less impacted but directly by that type of atrocity than by, you know, East Europe becomes pro-Russia again. So you just hinted at Putin's, you know, three to five year strategy in Eastern yeah. Europe, which is, you know, if I were Putin, I would start driving a wedge in Eastern European <clears throat> capitals and just legislatively having them withdraw from NATO oh, yeah. as a first step. Absolutely. Um, then there's Serbia and Kosovo, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like, what are yeah. the chances that that Serbia goes back into Kosovo, invades? What would we do? Well, in that that, I think that's a good question. And all you know, Albania and you know, Serbia and Russia have a strong history, political history. The mm -hmm. beginning of World War One was about this, and. Russia has always viewed itself as defenders of, of Orthodox Christianity. And they already have the, the Putin doctrine kind of as sort of like the, uh, the Nazi Laban's realm. We, we got to, you know, there are, there are ethnic Russians there that we have to protect in the Baltics and places like that. So I think if the U.S. was to withdraw its leadership from NATO, I think there's a, you know, Russia, Russian mission creep, I'm not sure, Russian creep, let's call it creep into East Europe to try to break it up, break out of NATO, you know, I think that would start to, to happen. And by 2030, what would it look like? How far would it get? And I think that, and it would be very hard to put that Humpty Dumpty back together. Totally agree. All right, my friend, we are way over time. Right. As always, appreciate your insight. And we didn't solve the problem today, but I think we gave the world a pretty good prognostication of what's going to happen because it's fairly obvious. If we don't, yeah. you know, if we don't do something to counter it. So, yeah. all right. As Very always, cool, Sean. All right. Take care. Next time. All right. Thank you, Sean. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.